come back uh, after a hopefully relaxing summertime to our first session in this autumn. I'm very happy to say that activity is gaining momentum again, and we all are, are working very hard to provide the host system community the best content we can. And you might have noticed in, in the comments on the channel, we have reached 400 subscribers. And honestly, that's a very, a very cool number for us. Um, also stay tuned for news about society business um, that will come out in, in the weeks to come. Probably the best thing to, to get those news is following us on Twitter. If you don't do already, the handle will um, also be in the, um, in the comments section on, on YouTube. Now, I'm very excited to continue the Lou Oberndorf lecture series with our speaker today, Professor Shafi Ahmed. And I really hope we will be able to broaden the, the interest and the interactions of our society also uh, with the surgical community. We are really proud to have a three times TEDx speaker at CESAM Online today. And this is um, Professor Shafi Ahmed, who is currently a consultant colorectal surgeon at the Barts Health NHS Trust. And he's, he's teaching at several universities, Harvard Medical and the Imperial College in London being among them. He's a very active and innovative person. He has co-founded several companies and is a very strong promoter of augmented and virtual reality in surgery. Basically, he's helping shape the future of surgical education. Um, futurist is a term uh, I often found used describing him, and I think it's, it's a very appropriate term. An interesting point is that he has been awarded the accolade of the most watched surgeon in human history. And by watching him today, we will obviously continue this trend. Now, before I hand over to Lou, I would like to thank the whole of the executive committee for um, and all of our community for your support and the work that you're doing in, in this type of time of, um, yeah, of global struggle. Thank you very much. And now I'm handing over to Lou. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Greetings, fellow CESA members. As Mark has introduced me, I am Lou Obendorf, and we very much look forward to being together with you in Milan this week. Unfortunately, as we all understand, we are facing extraordinary times. I want to mention that you, the healthcare workers and members of CESA, have made extraordinary sacrifices, and your professionalism and your diligence and your efforts and the front line of our defense against this global pandemic has revered you to us for all of your efforts. You are our new heroes. I wanna thank and congratulate the leadership of SESM, the executive committee, the science committee and all the staff for making this important pivot using technology to keep our mission and our communication alive in SESM in absence of a physical meeting. They have been very innovative, very entrepreneurial. And as such, uh, we in the Obendorf Foundation uh, remain committed to the mission and role of CESA. This Obendorf lecture series is designed to give you and provide for you the challenges and opportunities that these interesting times present for us. The three speakers they have chosen for this Obendorf lecture series will continue to challenge you, continue to offer you new opportunities to use our experiential technology and what we have developed over the last 25 years as a community in new ways to teach, new ways to communicate and challenge and educate. The mission and goals of SESAM are alive and well. And we will stay with you and we will support you. Thank you very much. Be well. Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, simulation keynote. Uh, for the next half an hour, I'll be talking about holograms, avatars, and the extended extension to reality, which is called a paradigm shift for simulation and medical education. I'm Professor Shafi Ahmed, I'm a surgeon working in London, 
Over the last four or five years, I've experimented with new ways of teaching both medical students and surgeons across the globe. For the first video, I'm going to show you a glimpse of the future. We're living in amazing times, of course, and the future is being really catapulting us into a great new vision where we can actually think about how these technologies will evolve in medical practice. So here's a video I uh, created with Anthem, a large insurance provider in America, and it just gives you a small glimpse of my talk as we go on. Last quote, quite interesting. Uh, it's from Abraham Lincoln. It's saying that um, we have to create the future ourselves. That's the best way to think about that future uh, as we predict it. Let's go back about five years ago. So, at the World uh, Economic Forum in Davos, the uh, chairman talked about this concept of the fourth industrial revolution. He talked about the fusion of technologies that are going to blur the lines between the biological, physical, and digital spheres. And what we're seeing now is acceleration, especially in the last six months with the pandemic, where we are now in the midst of this fourth industrial revolution. What we're talking about is a number of technologies. We are so lucky to be alive in 2020. We're seeing a convergence of technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, 5G, the computer brain interface, cloud computing, wearables, nanotech, apps, robots, AI, all converging the same point of human existence. We call it an inflection point for humanity. So the question for us is, how do these technologies enable us to provide better training and simulation for doctors around the world? So here we are, wonderful opportunity. And this is how we're going to think about it. Don't think about one technology on its own. Think about how they interact together and converge to improve the health and outcomes of our patients, but also to help us educate people. As we move to more what's called globalization, we have to think about how do these technologies connect the world in better places? Can we teach and train and simulate across the globe, allowing tens of thousands of people to learn from a single teacher? How do these technologies make healthcare and education more equitable around the world? So the word globalization 4.0 underpins that fourth industrial revolution. What about education? I remember the teacher talked and we listened. We had to memorize quite a lot too. A lot of time was spent giving out books and collecting them up again. We were sitting in rows in desks so we could see the board better because talk and chalk was the way. There must be an industrial revolution in education in which educational science and the ingenuity of educational technology combine to modernize the grossly inefficient and clumsy procedures of conventional education. Sydney L. Presse, 1924. These young people are studying in a new way. A computing calculator designed for use in high school classrooms has created tremendous excitement among educators. The tool which has made this possible is the high-speed digital computer operating with electronic precision on great quantities of information. If we think about the third industrial revolution, that was PCs and the internet. And, and we just about caught up with that. The fourth industrial revolution is what becomes possible from those technologies. Industry 4.0 is the next big shift in the way that manufacturing operates. Digital know-how is going to be hugely important and then people will need to be flexible because the world will change. At the future workplace and future societies 
uh, we're still moulding them as we go and technology is one of the main pillars in what is shaping what the future will look like. The pace of change is remarkable with the introduction of these exponential technologies creating a paradigm shift to create Education 4.0. That's kind of where we are, the concept of the fourth industrial revolution, education 4.0, society at 4.0. The first thing to remember as we explore this new brave world is to change our mindset. Humans are linear thinkers. We think in small steps, incremental, linear steps, and healthcare has been notoriously very slow to adopt change. And I think it's because we're risk averse and quite rightly so when it comes to clinical matters, but at the same time, we have to think differently. The world around us is moving exponentially, and we're seeing exponential technologies drive innovation, drive society, and therefore drive healthcare. And this is where we are. To give you an example, if I say to you, let's take 30 linear steps together, i.e. walking, everyone knows we'll get to about 30 yards or so. If I say to you, let's take 30 exponential steps together, We've gone around the planet 26 times. That's the pace of change. So the first thing about talking about the future of education simulation is changing your mindset, think differently, think more globally, how to adopt new technologies and innovation to improve the outcomes uh, for our learners. The last six months has been interesting, of course. We've been, um, I guess, uh, um, finding it difficult with the pandemic uh, that's taken over the world. But what's happened with the pandemic is also become an opportunity. What we've seen is the compression of time. This is a picture uh, from Final Fantasy IV. And if you've ever wondered what happens when time gets compressed, we've discovered it. We've seen the last six months, the adoption of technologies, innovation, we've seen less regulation, we've seen healthcare workers more amenable to move on. So actually we've catapulted six months of time into six years. We've moved so rapidly and there's no going back. This is of course the new normal. So let's think about where we approach the next six years uh, over the course and see how we can envelope and use these technologies. The first thing that we, uh, we struggled with is medical schools and other allied healthcare professionals and their curriculum. We haven't changed, we haven't evolved. The medical curriculum is still about five or six years long. The question I have, why is it still five or six years? Why can't we train doctors in three or four years? And more importantly, is the curriculum actually fit for purpose? I don't think it is. We still teach old fashioned and traditional methods of learning. How do we create the digital doctor of tomorrow? The person who's going to be ready for technology, for innovation, for entrepreneurship, and to become real leaders of the 21st century. So we've got to go back and change everything. One of the roles I had, I was Associate Dean at Barts Medical School for the last 10 years. And I thought actually five years ago, we need to change. I introduced a course called Barts X Medicine for the entire year, the entire cohort, to go through a, a course where they were taught by technologists, by computer specialists, by AI, by AI specialists, UI, UX teams, business people, coders, developers. They were taught by people who could run businesses, entrepreneurs. Now, these are my faculty from Silicon Valley, from New York, Harvard, and also from the UK. Our students were taught about the fundamental principles about innovation. They were given small groups to take ideas away using digital technologies to impact either education or their patients. They were given mentorship from the tech industry. And they were, we took them to King's Cross, to the kind of tech city. So look, let's get out of this um, uh, medical school, let's think differently, let's bring different individuals from society together. It's about collaboration. And in the end, they formed a few groups, they were giving mentorship with their ideas, and they actually went and become entrepreneurs. This was the first medical school in the world to embed that kind of learning into the program. I'm hoping others will follow suit. I'm now teaching Imperial at Harvard, at Bradford, with similar ideas about transforming and disrupting their medical education. And they're great. These young individuals want to be different. They're not like the doctors of yesteryear. They want to travel. They want to have two or three careers. They want to be entrepreneurs. They want to be leaders. And the medical school and the entire training doesn't fit their objective. Hence, a lot of them are leaving the profession. These are some examples. One group created a VR training platform. 
No one used AI interface. No one used kind of voice technology as voice assistant. Amazing ideas that come to fruition. It's important to remember that we're all connected. You're all seen, of course, the satellites now being put into the orbit, and you've seen the amazing SpaceX program. And of course, there's balloons by Google Loom, giving internet connectivity, drones by Facebook, and big cables from Facebook and Microsoft now powering the world that we live in. We are more connected. Now we've got 5G, and I'm actually the ambassador for Vodafone, uh, for the 5G network for connected healthcare. Think about how do we connect healthcare better using high bandwidth and low latency. So these are the kind of things we've got to think about. I have traveled a lot in education. I have spent the uh, last four or five years to over 35 countries thinking about how do we train people differently in the art of surgery. We have run interviews, run the International Surgical Training Program in my time as the Royal College Surgeon Council member of the last five years. And I think that we can train people in remote areas to democratize education. I've also been to conflict zones. In five years, I've been running 10 missions to Gaza. I think, how do we train people in conflict zones with barriers to adoption? How do we overcome some of these hurdles that we create for ourselves? I've learned a lot from that, which has propelled me to thinking about different ways of teaching people remotely. Let's go back. This is the picture that we're all kind of accustomed to about teaching, training, and surgery. It's about a surgery being the center of attention in a big auditorium where people are looking on. The amount of learning in that room is actually minimal. No one can see what's going on. It's crazy that we thought for years we could teach this fashion. Now, you may think that's really old fashioned and I haven't moved on. This was from only about 50 years ago. And this is a cardiac operation um, at the Texas Heart Institute. And you can see this is the kind of image we've. So I've challenged that, thinking how do we do it differently? The operating theatre for me was a place where uh, we could really redesign uh, teaching methods. I've experimented with many ideas. For example, most medical students in the operating theatre cannot see anything. They're in the back of the room for eight to 10 hours a day, uh, looking at smartphones on their social media, and not engaged at all, because it's difficult to engage when it's so busy and there's a tight space. When the Google Glass came out in 2014, I got it early, I was one of the glass explorers, and we decided to actually stream a live operation on that day. I streamed a live operation through my Google Glass uh, around the world. People on their smartphones using the app could actually just watch the operation through my eyes. They could text messages to me, which would appear on the corner of the Google Glass, which I could then answer in real time. On that day, I taught 14,000 students across 118 countries simultaneously, just by a 3G signal and a smartphone and a wearable tech. We create a whole platform of learning around this, as you can see on the bottom left, using peer-to-peer -peer teaching so people can integrate and interact. I even taught this man, John Scully. John Scully was the ex-CEO of Apple, um, who uh, I um, met in Dubai, and he's a good friend. And I taught him how to do a remote operation using Google Glass. At the age of 70 at the time, he performed really well. With simple instructions, I could remotely teach someone. So it meant to me that was a proof of concept. Fast forward, this was 2015, where we, we put Google Glass into the ambulances. So we could train and use it in moulage and train at the emergency area. This is what we were doing. Both the, um, the doctors were wearing Google Glass, relaying information back to the um, uh, A&E department to get real-time evaluation and communication. That was five years ago. 2019, Vodafone are now working on a concept of mixed reality. We can now actually relay information using a HoloLens system, for example, Microsoft, showing all the images, all the variables in real time, and actually manage it remotely. And this is going to be coming in, the smart ambulance. It's transformed the way we teach, train, imagine, training remotely using that concept. It's kind of where we are. We can also train using social media platforms. Social media, of course, are very powerful. Facebook has over 2 billion active users. Despite the limitations, despite their problems, uh, with fake news, etc., I've experimented playing around with Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter. Haven't quite got to TikTok just yet, and I've worked out how to teach people using these platforms. On Facebook, I taught 10,000 people, literally from Bangladesh when I was there operating. Twitter, I taught um, a live, I did a live operation for Bart Self, relaying in tweets the operation throughout the day, showing that we can teach in different ways. Snapchat, you might think, is um, a bit uh, interesting. It is. It's a platform used by young people generally. 75% of the 200 million users 
uh, between the ages of 18 and 25, the average age of our students. I did an operational Snapchat, which I thought was pushing the boundary a little bit. This is a hernia operation. And I shouldn't have worried. This was watched by over 2 million people. And within a month, it reached 56 million people via Twitter alone. And it showcased that we can actually use these existing platforms that use augmented reality, that real time and teach globally. My emphasis is about teaching globally, not one person or two persons, but teaching as many as you can around the world, expanding your horizons, letting everybody get that information on a global level. And we did an operation, live operation on Channel 5 um, about two years ago, uh, actually to the patients, to live on TV at uh, 9 a.m., uh, 9 p.m., sorry, on Thursday evening. And we thought that was, again, pushing the boundary about saying, are patients ready? Are the public ready for new ways of learning? And actually, we shouldn't worry. worried. We were shortlisted for a BAFTA award, and yours truly went to the BAFTA awards last year. We didn't win, of course, but it showed that actually we need to radically rethink the way we teach our next generation. Let's talk about immersive tech. Now, let's put that into context. What about immersive technology? Immersive technology is interesting. We use the term extended reality. On the one hand, you've got augmented reality, which is looking at glasses and having information overlaying, rather like a heads-up display on your car. And virtuality is at the other end, where you're actually immersed in a completely new environment and you can't see the outside world. That's virtual reality. In the middle, it's called mixed, mixed reality. The entire terminology is extended reality. Let's talk about that. In, let's talk about that a bit further. What's changed for us is the fact that virtual therapy is coming in, virtual medicine. We're now prescribing virtual reality for patients with phobias, anxieties. Soldiers coming back um, to, from a military exercise um, are now going through virtual training to reduce the exposure for post-traumatic stress disorders. We're using it for painkillers now. For, for patients who have burns, burns victims, who require dressing changes, it's been shown now that you can alleviate some of their pain by having distractive immersive therapy. We're seeing women now going to labor actually having VR therapy around epidurals. Back in 2016, I did the world's first virtual reality operation. We'd use augmented reality glasses like Google Glass and others, but I thought, what about virtual reality? We're about doing a live operation and, and training people globally using a smartphone, an app, and a headset, for example. And so we did the world's first VR surgery back in 2016. This 360 camera rig allows immersion. People around the world using a low cost technology, a simple VR headset, to actually immerse themselves in operating theatre around the world. So, what I was trying to demonstrate was that we can bring people from around the world to your own operating theatre, democratizing education. And it was high tech but low cost. A Google Cardboard cost about five pounds or so. So, for, for using a smartphone, a free app, and, and spending uh, five pounds on a Google Cardboard headset, you could just transport yourself in real time into another part of the world, which is great. It shows that we can democratize. We created a company for medical realities and we've been working for the last four years on immersive ways of learning. Talk Creative is a UI, UX kind of move into place that's intuitive. You can walk into a virtual reality environment, navigate the contents, go to bits like the operation, for example, in the 360 degrees that we were talking already, interacting with hotspots, getting an assessment with one afterwards, looking at the anatomy, and trying to and then simulating the operation at the end, which you'll see. This is the video of the operation, from 360 degrees. And you can be right in the centre of that, interacting with all the people in there. Picking up video clips along with the and layers. Suddenly, you're not in the back of the room anymore, you're sent to stage and engaging with the surgery operation. And here we are looking at the content, looking at anatomy, looking at CG animation. Talk 
course, it's about simulation. This was our first attempt uh, about three years ago in how we can make a chess champion in virtual reality. And now we're creating a whole load of new collaborations in VR. So you can replicate what you do in real life. And these will get better and better, knowledge improving, etc. This is the kind of thing we've been working on. Now, through the pandemic, we're seeing a huge interest in our platform because obviously there's no face to face for six months. People are now looking for new ways of learning. And that is where suddenly immersive tech is centre stage. We also created OSCEs. This is for our medical students. So no exams were performed this year. This is our OSCE training. You can actually do real exams, I guess, uh, in virtual reality, interact, see what's going on. And we've launched about 25 OSCEs over the last six months. It's now been used by medical students around the world. So it's kind of our new concept of VR immersive training. We're the first in the world to launch such a platform. We worked with universities. This is a path lab in Leeds. And we just wanted them to learn how, around the path lab, how it works, uh, and anatomy. This is the anatomy uh, theatre, so you can create real learning anatomy in real time. So actually, you can actually appear in 360 as a uh, participant and learn, rather than being there at the same time, avoiding the face-to-face. -face. Also, patient journeys, of course. Here we are on a patient journey. Patients now can do a 360-degree kind of tour uh, through a hospital looking at the pre, per, and post-op uh, journey, what they might expect, etc. This is what we created for the um, uh, Hare Food Hospital uh, around their cardiac patients. And in 360, you can see the whole thing and how they might imagine it. It takes away some of the stress, anxiety, and they get into the operating theatre. Learning is going to move on, of course. This is a smartphone app called Insight Heart. We can actually now use augmented reality to learn. You can be in your own room anywhere you want, and you can overlay information in real time. So you can see various learning methods. You can learn cardiology, for example, here, or, or other um, uh, areas of, of medicine. So this is just using a smartphone and AR. In the operating theatre, what you can see is a plethora of planning um, uh, devices and apps. This is using the HoloLens, and actually looking at images overlaid on the patient. This could help with planning surgical operations, potentially. It could reduce the complications, improve the accuracy, and obviously make sure we don't delay uh, time during the procedure. This could be the new way of going forward. Training surgery, of course, is difficult. Last six months, no surgical trainees had the chance to operate because they've been uh, banned from the operating theatre generally because of COVID and redistributed to the front line. Here we are. This is Justin Barrard from Oso VR, who created a great platform for surgical training. And they've just raised 14 million today uh, as a next stage of investment for their company. So you can see how VR training simulation is going to revolutionize the way we teach our students. In the operating theater, you can overlay information in real time. This is uh, Maki Sugimoto from Japan, uh, with a company called HoloEyes. What he's done is using mixed reality devices, is overlay images. It's not perfect yet, it's difficult, um, and this will get improved. And at some point, we'll be able to kind of show tumors, vessels, important structures to avoid during the operation in real time. Obviously, we shouldn't operate with these devices at the moment because you can't see well enough and the field of view is quite narrow, but this will undoubtedly improve as we go forward. My work has always been about democratizing healthcare education. How do we reach people in those parts of the world that are underfunded, that are poorly represented, that, uh, that require different ways of learning? My team medical realities of this is we went to Sierra Leone and we thought, how do we train people there? And we recorded uh, an amputation, which we then sent around Sierra Leone so they could learn in VR. Good morning. My name is Dr. Ruth Taylor. I am a doctor house officer at Connor Hospital. I love this headset because they give me an experience as if I'm in the theater. And the best part is I can see everything. In the theater, sometimes it's crowded. Sometimes you can't actually see the procedure. But with this, I get to see everything clearly. So you can see that suddenly these ideas are now could uh, democratize uh, healthcare education around the world. But it's not just a fad, of course, it has a basis. The Maisie report uh, a few years ago suggested that you could retain 80% of more of the facts and knowledge in VR than conventional online platforms. 80% is a large amount. This is the report by uh, PwC only a few months ago, showing that actually using VR, employees were much better in the way they were learning. They were more engaged, they learned quicker, they were more focused and more confident. So actually, 
it adds value to the learning platform. Over the last few months, we've seen the change in the doctor-patient relationship. With less face-to-face -face contact, we're now doing remote medicine. Here we are, 924. The futurists of then were talking about the radio doctor, the future doctors. What they're describing 100 years ago was telemedicine, okay? And also teleeducation, way before we even considered it. So these technologies are now allowing us to improve upon what they were thinking 100 years ago. The world that I live in now is about avatars, holograms, virtual reality. I'll explain that in a moment. This is a picture of me, actually me, in the operating theater, looking at images and trying to interact with my colleague. And I'll show you what that means in, in a few moments. I've always wanted to transport myself. Having traveled so much around the world, I realized it's expensive, it's time inefficient, and of course it ruins our planet. So how do we transport ourselves in real time to be effective somewhere else? We've seen Zoom calls, we've seen Microsoft Teams now becoming the remote assistant for us in this regard for education and healthcare. Uh, we thought we could see something different. This is me with the Max HoloLens a couple of years ago. And I thought, wouldn't it be good if I could put the headset on, connect with my colleagues in two parts of the world, from America and also from India, Mumbai, in real time? Could we share images in the operating theater? Could we do an MDT based on avatars and mixed reality? This is what we did. Hi, everybody. Hi, Safi. So the HoloLens itself really allows us to reshape the way we connect people, we communicate with people, and also to be used in teaching and training. Initially, when you put the HoloLens on, it feels a bit strange, but actually within a few minutes, it becomes quite normal. You feel as though you're just discussing cases with people in the same room, for example, like we do in normal hospital practice. We can come in and actually yeah. look at this content in full 3D, and obviously when you're working yeah. in, in this case, the medical field, having a full 3D understanding of a situation, for example, is really much more powerful in solidifying how you want to navigate it in your mind. So that shows you kind of avatars in mixed reality, connecting, creating a new MDT kind of scenario. What about if you really made yourself digital? This is me using a process called photogametry using 105 Nikon cameras, creating this virtual self. And this is now we're moving to the world of digital and virtual humans. Imagine if that could be trained in terms of in uh, voice technology and AI. So this is me as my hologram being transported in real time by a process called holoportation using mixed reality and using 5G because the huge bandwidth it allows. I appear, I don't know where, I can see, converse, well, it's a bit grainy, it'll improve as time goes on and you'll be able to really holoport yourself in the next two to five years. So I even gave a talk actually as a hologram. I was in, the, I was in London, I gave a talk in, um, in Liverpool uh, as my hologram. I appeared, gave my talk and disappeared. During the pandemic, we thought we'd do one step further. This is me in mixed reality and a smartphone con 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 conversing with my colleague in America about COVID-19. Hey, Dr. Ahmed, good to see you again. Hey, Harrison, so good to see you. Where are you? I'm in New York, how about you? I'm in London, uh, so good to see you. I think we've got Ian here as well, haven't we? Hi, Ian. Hey, guys, I'm in uh, downtown Atlanta right now. Thanks for joining me. I forgot my magic leap, but I've got my phone handy, so joining you through here. Thanks for, jo um, thanks for joining us. Should we have a look at some images to help us in this regard? Let's uh, yeah. try, I'm just going to pull up the image of the um, uh, virus itself, just to show you what it looks uh, like, Harrison, is essentially countries across here. These are China, Iran, Italy, and South Korea, as well as showing you the infections and... Um, Recently, my colleagues at St. Mary's uh, were on the COVID-19 ward, used HoloLens to teach people remotely.
Uh, John's x-ray, please. Is that all right? This is a ward round with a difference. Those hand gestures are controlling a mixed reality headset. The doctor can bring up x-rays and scans. Thank you very much. And the rest of the medical team can stay in a non-COVID area, sharing a live feed of everything he sees. The last bit is about the real future. Can we really simulate our own brains in the future? We've seen great interest in the brain-computer interface. We've seen Neuralink and Elon Musk's vision around this amongst other companies. And actually, what we're seeing now is kind of this approach where we can actually repurpose the brain, connect the brain, perhaps to even teach, to simulate operations, education, upload and straight to the brain. His colleague of mine, called Nigel Ackroyd, who's controlling his arm through his own brain-computer interface. So this is not far-fetched at all. And here is the ultimate shaking of hands between man and machine. <laughs> That's really cool. It's okay, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, wow. shake my hand. All right. Last bit is about digital humans. I mentioned earlier, we recreate ourselves. It would be amazing if we recreate ourselves as we are, with empathy, with intelligence, and perhaps it will help us shape the world of the future. Hi, I'm Roman, a digital human brought to life by Soul Machines. With me, you can experience AI like never before because I learn and react emotionally like humans do. I look forward to meeting you. So, digital humans, avatars, brain-computer interface, virtual reality, holograms. You may think that future is never going to arrive. It's way in distance. But this is a quote from William Gibson, who is a, uh, an American-Canadian writer and author who coined the term cyberspace. But I love this quote, the future is already here. It's just not even distributed yet, which means we gotta make sure that what we have, the technology, the innovation, we share it on a global level and bring that future much closer to us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Shafi, I wanted to ask, I'm going to, there's a theme actually. So what I might do is I'll, I'll ask you the first part of this question and then there's a follow-on question because it, it's interesting. People have been debating this from a different perspective. So first of all, I think there's been a lot of excitement and eye-opening uh, in terms of the potential future for this. And then people, I guess, because most of us or all of us, uh, your present company excluded, have been educated in this system, but also been dealing as educators within these systems. And so people have asked a lot of question about the distinction between broadcasting, therefore the learner learning visually, and how do we bridge from that point to, I guess, what particularly in your specialty has been a, a very strong ethos of the way that you learn is this concept of deliberate practice. So the person performing the task and giving feedback. And so it, it strikes at least those uneducated, myself included on this chat, that that was something that people struggled with is how you bridge that. I wondered whether you would comment on that as a first perspective. Sure, and so it's a very good question, of course, David. Um, thank you for having me on Sassan, by the way. I'm glad to be on here. And I think there's two elements. One is uh, tele-mentoring. Like, you know, we teach uh, routine in any specialty. We teach um, when we're close by, we assist, we support, we mentor our trainees or students. So part of this technology allows us to do remotely. So just basically becoming more, um, I guess, remote systems and tele-mentoring is a new concept coming in. It's a number of companies now to have ideas in AI or other technologies, but you yeah, to help us support remotely. The other thing is about interactivity as well. I mean, one of the fundamental things we need to, to go forward with these technologies is, is actually validate some of the work, make sure there's kind of research behind it, that it compares with traditional methods of learning and actually probably improves upon them. We have to show that as well. That's kind of been missing for a bit. We've seen just a few elements I described in, the, um, in my talk around the PwC report, the Mason report. We've seen a number of other reports coming in now show the value added 
using new technology. So as we move on, David, I think the um, the the clin clinical workforce, I think, will be encouraged by some of the things coming out and it will come out over the course of time. Is that kind of, kind of we're in this phase where we're adopting and translating quite hard technology, but we're struggling with some of the validation. And I think we need to just uh, do a bit more of that work to ensure that the, the clinical teams, etc., are happy that they are doing the right thing going forward. But uh, in any special anesthetics, wherever it is, we're seeing great, uh, we're seeing great uh, kind of um, uh, use cases being developed in this area. And the last thing to say is continue on learning today. People often worry about these new ideas, but it's not new. We've come from, go back history, David, we've come from uh, papyrus from Egyptians and books during the kind of uh, period in the Middle Ages. And now we've had online platforms. They are VR mixed around, they're just an extension of learning platforms. All they are is how we use them is more important. And that's why people like CESA and other organizations are crucial to understanding where that ability and that value lies. This is those uh, classic calls where you forget to unmute yourself. I nearly did. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shafi. That certainly uh, starts to address that. Um, and then the second part that I think people were questioning or asking questions about is, so when you find yourself in these situations where you have, I think in one of those situations, several tens of thousands of people um, tuning in, how do you uh, stop the person educating, particularly in the examples that you showed us, to becoming sensory overloaded that impacts on the task that they're trying to perform, both from that perspective, but also from a perspective of ensuring that there's a um, an opportunity for all of those tens of thousands of learners to actually interact with the educator. Yeah, really good question. So no, I think one of the keys is about um, understanding what the view is seeing. Is that moderation, David? We're going to maybe a uh, stream of operation or procedure. We put things in place for having a moderator on standby. We can filter through some of the major questions that's coming through, answer some of the questions themselves, create peer-to-peer -peer learning. So what we did actually, we had all these thousands of people teach one another on the, on the chat on the right-hand side of the, of the uh, viewer. So they could answer most of those questions, have a conversation around it, learn from one another. And we just take out a few of those questions for moderation and put those in the glass. So we can actually interact in a way that was sensible. But also, we don't want to overload the person, the practitioner, when they're doing an operation as well. And so, kind of balance judgment and what works. It's not so for everybody, but everyone can do this. Look, these are other things about these operations or procedures we do. They're not new operations, David. We're showing some amazingly new robotic procedure never seen before. These are standard procedures we teach them on a daily basis. What we're doing is projecting that to a bigger audience and understanding. What that can look like. Um, and you know, when I say operating theatre, it really is a theatre. We can use it in a way that shows actually how can we learn the environment in a way that's safe for the patient, also effective for learners around the world so they engage properly. Uh, great, thank you very much. Um, and then actually, the, the people are skipping ahead almost here. So I, I had uh, a question here from uh, Will Marriage. Uh, that asks, he says, I wonder whether we could use these technologies to support clinical teams in the process of transporting critically ill patients. So far from not, uh, I guess, if I'm understanding his question correctly, he's asking whether there's a bridge between not just education, but I guess, as we've seen with simulation over the years, it started with focusing on education. But as the uh, let's call it a specialty or the field matured. Now, when you look at simulation as a practice across the world, it predominantly it focuses on systems evaluation, patient safety, improving processes. And so I guess the question is, do you see this technology uh, in that same way evolving to help us with clinical decision making or patient clinical care rather than just education? Absolutely. So education is just the tip of the iceberg in this case. What we're seeing now is that it's about the clinical applications. So I showed you a video about the remote ambulance, for example, where they're now using kind of mixed reality devices in Italy, and now they're doing it in the UK as well, where you can actually relay real-time information from, say, a trauma scenario or triage, for example, and get that information in real time to the host hospital. And to help the gold an hour or to look at so what's going on to learn from. So absolutely, these are the opportunities we have in the practice. And we're seeing also because the pandemic, this is really crucial, David, 
last six months, and none of my surgical students have had any of this training at all. They've been repurposed to the front line. We've had medical students who are desperate for face to face. It's not going to happen for about a year. So this is the opportunity of these new ideas that allow those same people, perhaps not to get real life experience, but at least to almost replicate, simulate areas of training, there's ward rounds, clinical work, clinical patients, and also simulation work we've seen already in my presentation. So I, I think it's all around the fact that we have an ability and a reason now to prepare ourselves to create those solutions. And at least for me, the last six months have been crucial in the adoption of these technologies. Yeah, about a year ago, I'd say, I'm not sure we're not ready for it. The community is not ready. The use case aren't ready. And now we're seeing a drive. And look at Holland. We've now got a use, use group in the UK. We're seeing a Holland can be used for remote teaching training. At my medical school, we're thinking about implementing uh, remote ward rounds already for the next couple of months. We are training for some of our students. So I, I think now we're seeing that change uh, and seeing the wider adoption, not just of education, but clinical care as such. Uh, great, thank you, Sheffi. Um, I, I, I I'm going to roll a couple of questions into one here, that, uh, just to uh, try and address that. I think, for me personally, one of the things I reflected on as I heard you speak, something I've struggled with a lot over the years is someone who works, or has the privilege to work in a, even though we all think we're under resourced, a, a relatively well resourced, well funded healthcare system. And the inequities that as I travel around the world that I see in healthcare delivery and the potential of this technology to actually to help us start addressing that as a global healthcare community. But as I'm and I was particularly struck by your example of all you need is a smartphone with uh, 3D or 4G or whatever, and the implications that even in some of the poorest healthcare economies across the world, everybody has a phone nowadays. Um, and so the question, uh, I'm rambling on, the question I have is that what I find is that when you introduce new technologies or try to, even in the environments that you and I work, um, because of the innate sort of governance processes within healthcare, there are so much red tape and barriers to do that. Um, and I wonder how we, uh, it strikes me that we're in the process now, as you said, amazingly, some of that red tape has disappeared. Um, which has been one of the positives of COVID. But I wonder how we take those lessons to expand that, to then uh, make sure that those constraints uh, help us to sort of, uh, to, to expand those things so that we have a global impact using these technologies. And that's, uh, of course, the uh, very good question. First of all, I think people ask about the cost of technology, take that in isolation. And the cost, um, it's about having high-tech, low-cost solutions. So as technology gets better and more affordable, these solutions become more cheaper. And I just had access to a smartphone. It's better because it just hasn't reached the entire corners of the globe, but sooner or later, it will do. The vast portion of the population do have access to a smartphone. We're seeing telemedicine, for example, taking off, update thousand percent more utilization around the world. So that's one thing about cost. Now think about, so, so people often talk about technology. It's not about technology, David. It's about change management, change of people's perception social range of society to understand different ways of working, different ways of learning. And that's as part of that's the, the challenge for all of us. Trying technology at a problem isn't the solution. It's an enabler, it helps and support. So a lot of the work that we see, we have seen uh, repurposing, the changing of the playing field for the pandemic. It's a bit easier to um, innovate and uh, uh, I guess uh, translate into clinical practice and education, uh, as well as less red tape, less bureaucracy and less regulations. We've seen that. I think the global pandemic has taught me personally, and I think uh, we need to understand, this is a global pandemic with global solutions required. We've seen now fundamentally, we have to share some of that learning with what? Well, it's due to looking at, for example, how we manage the pandemic in countries like Taiwan and Japan and other places who've been used to these viruses. We've been learning actually how to share the knowledge base around the world. So I hope what we see is resetting uh, rather than being, um, I guess, thinking about oneself, being very insular. So how does that globe affect better how we impact, etc.? The world that comes up seeing now with the social for good contract with trying to benefit others, and I think that's scaling up their solution. So I, I think it's a different world we're living in. I think there's opportunity for this, David. I think there is a purpose. Uh, and I think the, uh, the clinical work will start uh, much more digitally already in their mindset. And that was the hardest thing, I think, that could have been achieved before. 
now we're seeing that should be slightly easier for us. So I'm optimistic that some of these will stick going forward, but they're by sharing concerns about, about how to propagate uh, and improve healthcare around the world using these technologies. But I am a, uh, an optimist in that sense. Sorry, let me just unmute. Um, Shafi, I don't, uh, one of the, the, the final questions that I, I'm just looking through whether any new ones have come up. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask you uh, just a final question. It strikes me that uh, some of the innovations that I've seen over time, the rate of the development of these innovations over, almost outstrips the um, rate of development uh, of healthcare delivery. Uh, and certainly if I reflect over my career, the things I saw 15, 20 years ago and the rate at which that's developed, I feel like, and this isn't this technology, I should requalify that. I think medical education has struggled to, um, to prepare the healthcare professional student of today for the health, their healthcare reality. Because it's almost by the time they qualify, that reality has already shifted. And, and so I was really interested by your, uh, um, your uh, Medicine X curriculum um, that you had. Uh, and I'm wondering, how do we ensure that we train healthcare professionals that remain prepared for the healthcare environmental reality uh, that they have to work in? Yeah, no, it's a really, well, thanks for that question, David. And it's something I'm very passionate about, of course. Let's go back one step, the World Health Organization uh, their report on the workforce planning points the fact that by 2030 will be about 40 and a half million health workers short around the world. And that's probably a concerted estimate. So we've got a huge gap problem of trained people. That's the first thing. Um, so how do you overcome that? You either can actually work more smartly and work, use workforce in a more smart manner, which I think is the kind of the key to put a challenge. But also how do you train people in the current context to be, I guess, more digital literate? and improve the digital literacy amongst our healthcare workers. So I go back to an example, medical school. Now, decades ago, David, you know, nothing's changed really in medical school. It's still a five, six year program. We still would teach clinical skills, pre-clinical skills, uh, science, basic science, etc. in a different way. Maybe had a PBL here and there, or maybe had a different kind of um, emphasis, but it's still much the same. And um, what we haven't done is, like, are these students ready for this experience uh, of today's to work? So the other thing is to understand Generation Z. They're different to what we are, David. We train the old fashioned system, uh, and uh, those are long gone. A new generation of doctors, you've seen already, they want to have uh, different careers during a one career, two, three careers, for example. They want to uh, have better work life balance, make those choices, leaving professions that then offer that. They also want to be able to travel, they want to be entrepreneurs, and they want to be future leaders. So we haven't, really, we haven't created a curriculum designed for these people we're lagging behind. So one of the about sex, I said, look, we, we've got to do something different. These students need to be trained in the digital skills. It's so relevant. So four or five years ago, when I was, when I was bashing the medical school, I said, we're going to change. They're very uh, receptive to my ideas. And yes, let's do this, Shafi, whatever. But it's only now, this year, they realize the full benefit. So Shafi, we need to do more of this. We've got span because actually what you said five years ago is absolutely relevant. And so I'll give you an example today. I used to run the surgical training program in London. It's often advertised for jobs in our own hospital at Royal London for a surgical trainee, SHO, or a, a core trainer, for example. Level. Often, we get no person uh, applying, or people applying who weren't good enough. We'd go to interview, no one would turn up. They go to interview the person who wasn't good enough. We often have no person appointed, and that's common around the country. And so I said, okay, well, why is that happening regularly? There's a dearth of people out there, and it's a uh, it's the kind of difficult market. So I repurposed the jobs. Let's talk about innovation. I created innovation fellows. So my uh, job was social innovation fellow, three days in clinical practice, two days innovating, doing things with tech companies, working outside healthcare, etc. In one day, I had 400 applications in all around the world. It just meant that we weren't designed the jobs that were relevant to today's society. We still go for one in four on call, you've got to do the sessions, but actually, that's not what they want. So it's really about changing medical school, improving digital literacy, disrupting education, uh, think about how we short and train, repurpose the workforce, and the jobs should be relevant for today's society. A number of levels are a challenge for all of us.
Uh, thank you very much, Shafi. That's uh, certainly uh, stimulating and, and thought provoking in terms of how um, I guess we're all part of that process. Um, I think, um, yeah, that I think I hope I've done it. I think I've so <laughs> scrolling through everything. I think I've pulled uh, most of the questions we've had together. So uh, thank you very much for a, a stimulating and thought provoking uh, talk. And thank you everyone for engaging with the, uh, the chat and the questions um, on the uh, on the video feed. Uh, so thank you very much.